Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the ODF Office Hour. And I have so many guests today, but I'm going to start with our favorite, Daniel Parks. How are you? Hi. How are you, Michelle? I'm doing okay. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, too. So what? tell us about our guests. What are we talking about today? Yeah, so the idea today is we're going to cover the new features that we have in ODF 411 that has been released um, a week ago. And then also we're going to give a little introduction of the new features that we have in OADP version 1.1 no, that is also has been released just a couple of days ago. No? So helping me on, on this task, I have Marcel that is going to help us with the ODF side of things. Marcel, if you want to give a little introduction of yourself, yeah, certainly. My name is uh, Marcel Hergaard. I'm in the marketing department of, of Red Hat and supporting today with explaining about the new features functionalities in ODF 4.11. And for OEDP, we have here, uh, thank you, Siobhan, for your time. We have here, it's going to help us also covering the OEDP new features. So uh, a brief introduction if you want, Siobhan, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Siobhan Pampatiwar. So I work as a software engineer and uh, I work on OEDP, specifically under the migration engineering. So I'll give you guys an overview of what we worked on in OEDP 1.1, what we feature, what the features we shipped, and just a brief outline about each of them. Nice. Great. Great. So if, if you like, I'm going to share my screen just a moment. So we, we have a little slide here. Okay. I'm going to just share the screen. And let me put this in slideshow. And you can let me know if you see everything OK. Looks good. Yeah. OK, so just while we go through the features, we have some slides to, to give us a little idea of, of the new features that we have. The, the first thing that I wanted to cover very briefly before we start with the cool new features you know, that we have in ODF it's just a, a warning or, or something that we have to take in account is that currently with, with ODF, with the version that we have right now, no, that is 4.11.0, um, um, it's not possible to upgrade from ODF 4.10. So for customers that are running ODF 4.10, at the moment with this current release that is GA, it's, we are not able to do an upgrade. This is because we found a bug in Red Hat CFS storage that as you know, and we have already spoke about in other shows, um, really Ceph is the is the storage layer that is underneath ODF. No, and and in one of the components that is called Raiders Gateway, we found a little issue that is blocking the upgrades from 4.10 to 4.11 right now. So if you're new to ODF and you want to deploy 4.11, you are fine to go. If you are a 4.10 customer and you want to deploy a new cluster with 4.11, that's also perfectly fine. Um, in the near future. I think that is going to be very briefly once we are able to ship um, ODF 411.x, no, a maintenance release that includes Red Hat CFS Storage version 5.3, where the bug is already fixed. Then you are able to, we will be able to do updates with with no issues. No, so just that little warning or advice there before we begin. And now I will give the. Um, the the turn to to marcel so he can start covering a little bit the new features that we have in, in odf go ahead right. Marcel. Uh, thanks a lot uh, daniel and um first of all uh, I, I would like to start with the multi-cluster monitoring with rh acm and now you might think like okay what's what is this uh, acm about well actually um it is a management tooling and um, it can be used for a multi-cluster kubernetes lifecycle management policy-based governance risk and compliance management, and also the application of um, uh, lifecycle management for applications, sorry. So what does it provide? It provides you with an end-to-end -end management visibility to manage your Kubernetes, Kubernetes environment. You can deploy and maintain day two operations of business applications that are distributed across your cluster landscapes. Clusters and applications are all visible and managed from a single pane of glass, or so from a single console, if you will, with built-in security policy management. And it can also uh, help you with multi-cluster networking. It provides cross-cluster network infrastructure with Submariner for direct uh, and security-focused communications. So this is in a nutshell what, uh, what, what ACM is about. And now move on to the uh, capabilities that are introduced in the ODF 4.11. Uh, as mentioned, it 
provides you with a single view of storage health and capacity across multiple Kubernetes clusters. So you have an observability for fleet health and optimization. Multi-cluster dashboards can also store long-term historical data by this uh, functionality. And you can use the graphical console to identify, isolate, and resolve issues that are affecting your distributed workloads. And for the system administrator, this means that you have a single view uh, to monitor cluster health and manage consistently across multiple clusters. So there's no need to check in separately in each and every individual involved cluster. And from an IT C-suite uh, perspective, this reduces operational costs. Um, now you might figure, how do I get this RHACM? Well, our preferred way of selling the functionality with ODF 4.11 is by Red Hat OpenShift Platform Plus. And here, all these tools are included. So this is the introduction portion for the multi-cluster monitoring. I hope we gave you a little insight on, on what it is, what you can do with it. And there is, of course, a lot more to it. Can go in way more detail, but there is no time to do so today. So a, a little introduction and how it relates to uh, ODF 4.11. Um, yeah, that, that's a really nice feature, Marcel, as you said, because uh, Michelle, for example, has been working with Annette on the, on the DR. Um, work now where you have more than one cluster no, on, on your ACM and you can see more, more than one cluster. And the really nice thing now is that from that single pane of glass, as you said, no, from that ACM, you are able, you're going to be able to monitor all of your storage metrics, dashboards and everything from one single place about, in this case, like DR, for example. No? So that's a really, really nice feature. If you like, I will, I will continue with the, um, the MCG, the multi-cloud gateway um, GA features that we have in, in 4.11. These are small um, things that we have included, but I would like to mention them now. With, with MCG now, we can have the account credentials changeability option. This really makes reference to that we are able to replace or to reset the admin account of MCG or even any account. No? So if you remember when we deploy the multi-cloud gateway, by default, we get an admin user with a, with a password. Now it's really easy with the Nuba CLI to change that password without affecting the functionality of MCG. And in the same way, we can also switch or replace the, the authentication uh, keys. No? So as you know, when we want to connect to an S3 endpoint, we need an access key and a secret key no? that is going to authenticate us and is going to allow us to get access to our object storage. Now um, we can very easily, again, with the Nuba CLI, we can rotate those access keys and secret keys, and it will also take care of our object bucket claims. So let's say that you, you have an application using an OBC, an object bucket claim. Um, using the Nuba CLI, we're going to be able to change the access key and the secret key. That is really nice for security reasons, if it has been compromised or anything. And that would also change the, the secret in our namespace. So the next time we restart the pod, it's going to start using the new access and secret key completely transparently for us. No? So that's a really nice feature, especially related to, to security. And the last one that I have here for MCG, this is um, also related to security and it's in regards of the, of the S3 route. By the route, we mean the ingress controller. So when um, an application, when somebody wants to access from outside of the OCP cluster to the S3 endpoint, we need to go through the ingress or through the route that we call the OCP route. No? And, and what we have the option now of configuring is um, specifying if that connection has to be HTTPS or it can be HTTP and HTTPS. No? So we have the option of forcing every or all of the clients to use HTTPS or to maybe do a redirection. No? That, that wasn't possible in the past. So these are small features, but really nice additions to MCG. Uh, that we have now GA and ODF for 11. And Marcel, I don't know if you want to go into the tech preview issue um, topics that we have. Yeah, that's that's okay. Um, so we uh, we are going to address shortly the the new functionalities that come with ODF 4.11, which are uh, regional DR uh, metro DR metropolitan disaster recovery. We'll touch on the single node solution. New functionality being uh, introduced here and to be extended in, in uh, further versions of ODF, and we'll touch on NFS4 support. 
So um, um, please, Daniel, if you can go ahead to the next slide about regional VR. So we'll, um, we'll have a look at what this uh, actually offers. So what's being offered here, this is a protection against geographic skill disasters. Um, well, what does that mean? That you have two different data centers where you maintain uh, on both end clusters and you synchronize uh, the, the, the data and your, your application and workload data to the other location where it's uh, kind of um, uh, hot standby. Uh, calls, uh, the, the data is being replicated and you are able to, um, uh, to restore the application and the workload on the other location in the case of a disaster. So why is it important? Protection of application when a disaster strikes at the geographical location. How do we realize this? By having OpenShift Platform Plus on different geographical locations. Again, uh, you need OpenShift Platform Plus because this includes all the tooling and, and, uh, and the ACM mechanism to, uh, to make this happen. Um, it includes OCP ODF and ACM ACS, that's Advanced Cluster Security in Quay. Um, if you would buy all these components separately, uh, then you would <laughs> have, have a more expense uh, compared to having OpenShift Platform Plus. So that's also a, uh, a consideration. So it offers an asynchronous volume replication and that uh, causes you a low recovery point objective. So it's not zero, but it's very low. It's, it's measured in minutes. Um, and, and OpenShift Data Foundation enables cross-cluster replication of data volumes with replication interval as low as one minute interval. Of course, this will depend on the size and the, the bandwidth you have, but that's the lowest possible setting you can do. So ODF storage operators synchronize both the volume persistent data, but also the Kubernetes metadata for your uh, PVs and also for the applications. There are no distance limitations between the different clusters. There is an automated failover management, and that helps you to realize a low RTO. That's a recovery time objective. And um, ACM multi-cluster manager and the ODF DR operators enable failover and fillback automation at application granularity. So you can do all this on an application level. Both clusters remain active uh, with the apps distributed and protected by the alternate cluster. So this is in a nutshell what OpenShift disaster recovery, regional disaster recovery is about. And um, in a previous uh, session, Annette has uh, showed how this works in more detail. So this is just to give you an idea of what we're talking about with the new features. Then um, uh, I would like to move on to the next slide. That's the other type. That's the Metropolitan Disaster Recovery, aka Metro DR. And what is offered here? Well, this is all about the protection against localized site failures with no data loss. Um, so, and why is it important? Because quick recovery of applications with no data loss uh, have a zero RPO. So. Uh, really zero RPO recovery, you, you will lose no data with this functionality. How is it realized? By having, again, Red Hat OpenShift Platform Plus and Red Hat OpenShift Data Foundation. However, you require external mode here. And external mode means that the storage solution is off the cluster. So that means that you have an external uh, Ceph instance, and that's what we call external mode, and the both clusters connect to that external uh, system. Um, so you have synchronized, synchronous volume replication, and that, uh, that enables you for zero RPO. Multiple OCP clusters are deployed in different availability zones, and that provides a complete fault isolated configuration. External Red Hat Ceph storage cluster provides persistent synchronous um, replicated volumes across multiple clusters. You also need to have an arbiter node in a third site, and that can be a really a thin uh, a thing for, for a cluster monitor service to keep your quorum uh, up to date. And um, with MetroDR, a stretched storage layer applies, and it goes for both CephFS, the file system, and RBD block. Th those both can be replicated. Distance limitations to 10 milliseconds uh, round trip time between the different sites where OCP clusters and Ceph nodes with the drives the OSDs reside in. So you need to have a latency no higher than 10 milliseconds. The third node where the arbiter resides can have a higher latency, of course, and that's more in the range of 100 milliseconds and eventual higher because that's not 
that one is not responsible for actually carrying data. Uh, there's an automated failover management, uh, so a low recovery time objective, and um, advanced cluster manager, ACM, and ODF DR operators enable, again, the failover and the fillback, similar to the one with um, a uh, the regional disaster recovery. Sorry, I'm a little bit stuttered. Okay, then um, I would suggest to go to the next slide. Uh, this was the, the uh, Metro DR, and this is about the single node solution also named SNO, and now you might require what's this all about. SNO means single node OpenShift, and ODF LVMO is OpenShift Data Foundation, logical volume manager operator. operator. Oh, that's quite a few words. So it's an operator, and in short, it actually uses the Linux LVM on the move. So why do we need this? Sometimes apps are being deployed on a single node for, for, for edge uh, purposes, for instance, or for... Uh, um, uh, small office, home office locations where you where you don't have all the resources at hand. And um, this uh, ODF LVMO becomes the default storage provider in the next release, uh, starting with ODF 4.12. That's being planned for. Um, so why is that? Uh, ODF LVMO will behave similarly to the regular ODF on larger clusters. And this is to standardize, to have a standardized and, and common experience no matter if you run on a huge big cluster or on a single node. And the standardizing is good to keep application deployment complexity down. So you, you deploy your application, you don't have to worry about things. It's the same functionality under the waterline, it's addressed in a different way. So, and why do we think this is a great thing for, uh, uh, for, for SNO? If you look at the resource consumption uh, in a regular ODF cluster, starting position, and you have 24 vCPUs and 72 gigabytes of RAM. And of course, that can be reduced. Uh, if you only use whatever you need, for instance, only block, then you don't have to have all those resources. But this is the, the, the baseline for, for a normal uh, starting cluster. With ODF LVMO, you can do with less than one vCPU and only 1.25 gigs of RAM. So that's a big contrast. So you see it's very efficient. Uh, to use this. And also, with, if we look at the subscription cost from a Red Hat perspective, um, the regular ODF will be OpenShift Platform Plus with um, OpenShift Data Foundation Advanced Edition to have all this functionality with um, single node ODF LVMO. This is all included in an OKE OCP standard subscription. So to give you an idea. So there is also another slide. This slide is about um, um, the, the capability of snapshots and cloning. Um, this is very uh, interesting uh, feature because you can now uh, take a snapshot of a, for instance, a VM that you would run uh, in, in QVert or, or from a uh, containerized workload. And with the cloning capability, you can reproduce that very quick and fast uh, to, to have uh, multiple instances or a point in time. And it's all uh, dynamically proficient. So. Um, in, in a similar way that you would do normally with, with the standard cluster. And you have the ability of snapshots and cloning with the single node. This functionality is currently in tech preview state, but it's planned to become fully available by the end of this year, talking about the December timeframe in ODF 4.12. Um, I think this was mostly it from my side. So did yeah, I miss I something? That what I would add there, Marcel, just speaking about SNO no, or, or SNO and, and these new really nice features like a snapshot and cloning that really is the CSI drivers is that it also opens, um, um, let's say it opens a possibility of using OEDP that we can have Shivam now um, tell us about all of that. But now that we have CSI snapshots and clones, we can work with OEDP and that gives us the possibility of having backups and restores on snow clusters. Know that when we are speaking about single node OpenShift, that we normally have a single point of failure, or really we don't have HA because we have a single node, maybe having that possibility of, of doing backups and restores to a central location when we're working in the edge can be very, very interesting. But we can speak with about that with, with Shivam just in a moment. Yeah, I didn't want to get the grass out of his uh, way. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, thank you for, for adding that. And that's uh, um, ODF, uh, sorry, OADP uh, now also has native capabilities, but there will be more details later on. Um, and then you wanted to talk about um, NFS um, introduction. We now have support for, for NFS uh, services. 
Uh, and that means that you can now connect internal and external um, uh, processes actually to OpenShift, where we have this NFS service based on, uh, on ODF. And why does this make sense? Sometimes you have um, uh, workloads that require uh, NFS access to storage, and therefore they weren't capable to, to run in OpenShift because of uh, combined with ODF because of lacking this, this NFS uh, functionality. And now this is all possible. An example that I would like to mention is sometimes something that I ran into in the past. I was in a hospital and there they were doing these investigations and they had this uh, uh, DNA sequencers. Those things worked in the nightly hours and they produced data and they they put it on uh, on the network in an NFS protocol way. And the day after, then the you know the, the specialists they connected with their workstations with with an, with another way of, uh, of of share protocol, not NFS. But um, the data that was incoming was only capable to be pushed in by NFS. And sometimes you have legacy um, equipment um, in, in in industry that actually provides data through the NFS protocol. And now you have also the capability to integrate those. A legacy uh, uh, equipment or materials into OpenShift. But uh, Daniel, he had a demo available, so I'm happy to hand it over to him to show you how this actually works. Yeah, yeah, that, that is right. I will leave it for, for the end. So if we have time, we will just do a, a quick demo that of this really nice feature that is, is really um, easy to, to show and demo once we are once we have finished. And I think I will have five minutes um, left, I can show you. Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention very quickly before handing it off to Shivam is just uh, give an inter a brief uh, overview of, of the jargon that we use in Red Hat, just to be sure. No, when, when we speak about general available, as you can see on this slide, is, is a product that is ready for production and we have SLA. So if you are open a case with Red Hat, you are going to have your standard support from Red Hat and you're going to have SLAs depending on the a priority of, of the issue no, and, and, and um, the importance of that issue. Then we have Tech Preview. Know that in Tech Preview, there is already documentation. So you can go to the official um, Red Hat documentation site and you can check how to deploy that feature. But um, we don't have any SLAs for support. Maybe you can open a case and you will get like, a, uh, we will say like a best effort from support. They will try and help you out, but that you have no um, SLA support, so it's not really recommended for production. And finally, we have Dev Preview. In, in Dev Preview, let's say that the, um, the technical bits for the feature to work are there, are in the product, but you don't have any documentation and you don't have any SLAs, as you could imagine. So just um, to give a, a little uh, overview of, of these um, topics that we have when, when describing the features. And Shivam, if you want to go ahead and cover OEDP, please. Yeah, sure thing. So just to revise a little bit, what is OEDP? So OEDP stands for OpenShift APIs for Data Protection. So it basically enables uh, backup restore operations on OpenShift container platform. And we can use it basically for any stateful app or a stateless app, like without TVs or all with uh, what with all the native KDS resources and everything. So all in all, it's a backup restore operator. So regarding uh, OEDP 1.1, right? Uh, it has been a, a pretty huge release. Uh, it was released last week, like on September 1st. So a pretty huge milestone. So in OEDP 1.1, we basically shipped uh, two GA features and one tech preview feature. So the GA features are something which we worked upstream uh, in Valero 1.9. So the first one is um, enable existing resource policy to Valero Restore API. So basically, currently what happens is there is no policy uh, to be enforced on Kubernetes resources that already exist in the cluster. And if you're trying to restore the same resources from backup, right? So what happens is Valero skips over the restore of these resources, which already exist in the cluster. So via this feature, uh, we want to give the option to the user whether you want to overwrite these resources from the ones present in backup, right? So the use case which you can uh, foresee for this is, let's say you have a production cluster and you take up backup regularly uh, and there is a backup cluster. 
with the manifest and the state. So in in the production cluster, some operations or like as the time passes, the state of the production cl cluster changes, operations takes place. And you might want to restore it to the prior version, right? So in that case, you'll use the backup which you had. But if you don't enable this policy, it will skip over the restore of the resources and the delta won't be overcome. So in order to overcome the resource delta or the cluster delta, you'll have to set this policy on restore as update and it will try to override the resources and restore the state. So this feature can come in handy in that use case. So, uh, Shivan, just to check that if I understand understood it correctly, no. So then, in the use case that you were speaking about, no, where you have an active cluster, and, and let's say that we have like a um, a passive cluster, no, where where we're doing in the active cluster, we're doing backups all the time, and then on the on the backup cluster, we're doing restores, restore to keep up with the state that we had in the original cluster. Previous to this feature, um, when once we did the first restore in that passive cluster. Um, the next time that we did restores, they will be ignored, no? Because uh, as you said, no. Once it checks that the that the object exists, it will just skip it. And now we could do this use case, no? We could have this use case where we are all the time, let's say, backing and restoring to a passive site, so we have more or less the similar state all of the time, no? Yeah, you, you got it on point. That's exactly correct. Yeah. Mm, great. So that's existing resource policy. Uh, so the next feature is, it, this was also something which we worked on Valero 1.9 upstream. So that's multiple label selector support to Valero backup restore API. This is pretty straightforward. So let's say uh, in the backup restore API, you have currently a spec field called label selectors. That is a native Kubernetes label selector field. You can specify a label uh, and you can use this as a criteria to collect the resources for a backup, right? So the limitation of this thing is, uh, let's say you have uh, you want to create backups based on a set of labels. So you will have to create a backup with each label, right? And this can be cumbersome at scale. So what we did was we introduced a new field called or label selectors. So this supports or logic. So you can specify a set of labels and then what Valero does is uh, it will try to collect the resources uh, if any of the labels match with the resource labels. So if any one of the labels, basically. So you can create just one backup and have you can expand the criteria of your backup and restore of resources. So that's pretty straightforward. And that's what we implemented upstream and brought it in ODP 1.1. So those were the Valero 1.9 features which we introduced. Now for the big thing. So this is a tech preview feature that is OEDP CSI data mover. So this has been a huge ask, like pretty huge from the users, from the customers, from field. It's like we have had a lot of traction for this and basically we wanted this to implement like uh, in the first Y stream as well. So. So currently what happens is, uh, so CSI snapshots, right? Uh, whenever you trigger a backup, uh, let's say you have CSI volumes and you are uh, using CSI uh, volumes in your application. So basically CSI sn snapshots taken during the backup process are stored on the storage provider. For example, Ceph CSI, right? So these reside where the snapshots were taken, like on cluster. So that means that the snapshot data is not actually safe from disaster scenarios. Like when the cluster goes down, the storage goes down and the snapshot data also goes down. In short, what you can say is the SNESI snapshots are not portable or durable, right? So this is something which we wanted to solve and CSI data more solves this. So in OEDP 1.1, uh, what we did is we basically modified the upstream version of Valero CSI plugin uh, to copy the snapshots from cluster, like from on cluster to backup target. That is like object storage, uh, like Nuba or Amazon S3 or whatever your object storage is the backup target for your backup. So the snapshot data can actually reside outside the cluster and in disaster scenarios, you can recover uh, from the data. And basically this is this is the data movement that we want and that we envision and have introduced in the tech preview feature. 
So that's, yeah. that's really great. No, you remember if I can ask you because then you can really have that that wasn't possible before, like a full failure of your OCP cluster. If you have the data mover that is sending the data outside, you could just then restore, let's say, um, redeploy your OCP cluster, and yeah. then um, you can let's say install again the the OEDP operator that is going to connect to your external resource again once you set the connection to your target um, backup no and then you can restore the applications uh, back to your ocp cluster no that would be more or less the workflow yeah absolutely spot on that is like getting the state to back whatever it was right yeah. perfect perfect thank you is there anything else um, about oedp that you wanted to share sure yeah just one thing to add like so we are mm -hmm. continuously working and we would love to have the feedback that we can get so whatever feedback you guys can have uh, we can implement and bring it together in the next releases and our designs and implementations great great thanks a lot um just, just to finish from my side and um, going back to the, the summary of, of things that we had in in odf i wanted to add that we have very quickly here one in depth preview the last one that is again multi-cloud gateway and this is lifecycle deletion of expired objects. Really what this means for multi-cloud gateway, this has a, it's an AWS S3 feature, as you know, MCG is S3 compatible. And the idea here is that when you upload an object, you can have a policy that will tell the object to get deleted whenever um, it expires, no, the, the time that you set expires. You can also use this with object versioning. That is another feature that is available with MCG. And for example, you can say when I have more than two objects and 90 days have come past, then delete that second version of the object. No? So it's really uh, nice to have this feature so we can save uh, resources and total storage space for our object um, storage, no? in this case, MCG. And one of the things that is not mentioned here, but it's also we, we normally get with new versions now and then deprecations, and I am sure that this is something that you're going to miss, uh, Michelle, because you I know that you used it quite a lot with, with MCG, but uh, we no longer support and we don't have the link to the to the Nuba dashboard or to the MCG dashboard that we have in the past, because all of the features have been implemented now into the OCP dashboard. We have okay. to say good, goodbye no, to, the, to the MCG uh, Nuba dashboard that we had in the past. So it's better to have in the console anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we still have the Nuva CLI and then all of the CRs no, for Nuva that we normally use with OC, uh, GET, and, and the rest of the workflows that we normally do. That's still all there, but we have now removed that from ODF 4.11. So I don't know if you have any other questions, uh, Michelle, Marcel, or Shivam, anything that you wanted to say? I think that we have covered almost everything. If not, I will go ahead with, with the NFS demo. Or, or, or I'm always okay. up for a demo. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Perfect. So then let me move into the terminal. Is this big enough? Let me just do just so you check. Is this more or less okay? Inside. Sorry, let me. Remove this. If I enlarge the screen, I can see it, but uh, I don't know how about it. But, uh, it's that looks yeah, okay. Let me make it a little <laughs> bit bigger. Okay, that was a little bit bigger. So then, uh, what I wanted to show in this quick demo is, uh, as we explained, this new feature that is Tech Preview in ODF 411, and it permits us export uh, an NFS share, and then we can mount that NFS share from inside the OCP cluster. And also from outside of the of the OCP cluster, no. So we have those two possibilities. Um, to give you a little bit of context, we have here an OCP cluster deployed that is running OCP 411, and we also have a ODF deployed, as you can see, with version 411. No, so we are uh, running the latest versions. And to enable NFS, once you deploy ODF to enable NFS, you just have to patch a couple of resources. The first one is the storage cluster resource, as you can see here. The storage cluster um, CR 
is one of the, the configuration CRs that we have for ODF, no? one of the most important ones. And as you can see here, the only thing that we're doing is really saying enable NFS. No? So I'm going to get a, go ahead and, and run that patch. And also we need to uh, patch the config map for Rook. Rook is the operator that deploys Ceph for ODF. Again, as we mentioned, Ceph is the, the brains no? the, this, for the storage layer that runs underneath ODF. And here, what we are doing is that we are enabling CSI uh, drivers for NFS. So two things that should have happened when we run these commands, we can just uh, check with, let me move into the project of OpenShift storage first. This is where ODF gets, gets deployed. And if we do OC get pods and we grep by NFS, we should see here two things. Now we have our CSI, uh, plugins ready, so we are able to map um, the NFS resources to our worker nodes, and also we have the um, Ceph NFS service or daemon running. So this is great. This um, NFS daemon that we have running is really based on Ganesha. Ganesha is an open source project that has been um, available for a long time and is really like a gateway. So it, it, it offers NFS exports on one side, and then it can consume many different um, storage layers or devices underneath. In this case, it's using ODF or Ceph, no? in, in this case, that we have configured. So we, we are really running Ganesha under the hood. And also, if we check here, we should have a new object created that is called Ceph NFS. Perfect, this is also running. So really, if we want to now use or create uh, an NFS share, an NFS export, what we need to do is create a persistent volume. And the only difference that we see is that now, once we have enabled NFS with those patches, we have a new storage class, a storage class that is called Ceph NFS. And really exporting a new shared file system, a new NFS shared file system is as easy as creating a persistent volume using this storage class. So let me go ahead and just create a persistent volume using the CLI. Here I have my YAML. As you can see, this is a normal persistent volume claim. There's nothing different here. I'm telling it that I want to use things. And oh, Dan is getting a little staticky there. Can you repeat that? A little bit of Can you hear me? Can you? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daniel, maybe it helps if you uh, cut down your video stream, uh, then you have somewhat more bandwidth available for the demo, perhaps. Let's try this. Hang on. There you go. Okay, Daniel, we can't see you, but we can see your screen. Can you see? Uh... Can you hear me? Right, okay. Okay. Now I can hear you. Now you sound fine. All good. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to share your screen again just to go through that part? Oh. Maybe he'll join us. Give him a second. <laughs> now I want to really see what he what he was doing. <laughs> Hang on. That was just a teaser so far. Uh, right, uh, right. That's a trailer. Catch the yeah. rest of the next show. <laughs> oh, there he is. Hi. Okay. All right, you're back. Hi, hi. Can you hear me now? Okay. No, yeah, something went very wrong there. Yeah. So <laughs> let me just share my screen and we can finish off just a second where we were. We can continue. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so I think that um, I was at this point, no, when we were speaking about the persistent volume claim and how to really get a shared NFS um, export running, 
and we just need to create a normal PVC using the storage class you know, that we have especially created for NFS. So we can just go ahead and do a, a create. And this will give us um, a PVC. As you can see here you now for the NFS demo, that is 10 gigs in, in size. We can also do um, to actually consume it, because this is the only thing that we need to do to have the, the persistent volume and that share ready. The only thing that we need to do to consume it is create a pod. In this example, no, we could have a deployment of or whatever we want. This is to consume the NFS share internally. No, so we want to internally from a pod consume this NFS resource. So as you can see here, this is just a pod object where we are using the persistent volume claim that we just created a moment ago and that we are going to deploy very quickly. We get a warning there, but that's fine. If we do pod ref by NFS, we can see here that we have this pod, no NFS export pod. And just to show you that it actually is actually mounting an NFS share, um, we can just go into that pod a moment and I will show you the mount point. No, So here we have the mount point. This is the service. This is the um, exported file system ID, you know, the NFS ID, and this is the mount point where it's being mounted, no? so it's 10 gigs inside. So this is the shared NFS file system being consumed from inside the, um, the pod. We can also just do mount, just to check that it's an type NFS4 mount. No? So this would be uh, consuming it from inside because it's, it's NFS, it can be mounted by several pods without any problem, so it could be uh, consumed by several different applications. Then if we also want to access externally this same share, no? so we have a use case as Marcel shared an example before where we have a legacy application that needs to access some resource inside OCP, we could also make that work. So that the first thing that we need Okay, so Daniel, your audio is getting scratchy again, but your video is fine. <laughs> uh oh. Do you want to re try reconnecting again? Hello, sir. All right, so you've created the service which you just showed us. Okay, maybe we can talk them through it. <laughs> nah, it's been mute. Uh, let's go to SVC. Here, you can see that this is um, uh, a load balancer service that is exporting port twenty four nine, and this because this is AWS, this is a really an elastic load balancer. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to mount this um, shared file system from my laptop. No? So if you check here, this is my laptop that I'm using Fedora, and I'm just going to mount this file system. No? So if I do uh, just a normal standard mount command, but what I need to add here is the host where I want to mount or the load balancer endpoint, and also the um, the the id of the nfs share no that i'm going to just get it a moment from the pod that we had here just a moment ago so let me do bash as we did before just to get the id there are other ways of getting this but just so we don't take more time i will get it from here and then we can go into this part that i have here and just added at the end. So what I'm doing here is from my laptop that is completely external to the OCP cluster, I'm mounting um, a slash MT, you no know, slash mount. So I'm able to consume the, um, the same data from my laptop. You no, know? So here I have access to the NFS mount. 
no, and I could, sorry, but I, I, we could more, for example, do hello, just pipe it to in the stops HTML, for example, and now I could just pass it into the export pod that we were using before. And, and just check that we have the file here. No? So for example, we could do, and here you can see that we have the file that I just created from, from my laptop. No? So as you can see, really easy to, to export from internal pods, using internal pods, and also using external an external resource, maybe a legacy application. So really easy to, to get working and to, and to be able to use NFS shares as we said, this is tech preview because it's not it's not high available. It's still missing some features, no, that we would like to have, but it's it's, it's on its way. Very nice, awesome. Are there any anything any points you want to go over before I come up with? At the end of most shows, I, I think of the next show always. So I've already got it in my head. Oh, we need to do a show about this. We need to do a show about that. But before we get there, oh, we lost Daniel. Maybe he'll come back. <laughs> is there anything else that you guys want to touch on? Hang on, he's back already. He's back. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, okay. I lose it when I, I lose you. I, I can see you, but I can't hear you. You know, I lose you a little bit, but that's fine. <laughs> so I was just saying, do you want to recap anything before I think about some future shows we might want to do? Yeah. We covered there's... a lot. It was good. That was that was awesome. Okay, so <laughs> anything yeah, came to I, mind? Maybe I, you got it. That's good. Yeah, there's a thing that we wanted to show that we have spoken about today, you know, that is really using uh, SNO, no, like a single node OpenShift. Now that we have CSI snapshots, we can maybe uh, do a demo with, with Shivan where we will do the OEDP having an active site and a passive site that is really, that really fits really well with SNO, no? And then we can fail a full SNO node and do the restore and, and bring up the passive site or something like that. Right, and show how to use that... the data mover, right? It's yeah. really like, especially on, and so we we did a tech preview show, SNO with LVM, right? So mm -hmm. I've, I've had some tech preview shows around, but maybe it's time to start to bring all these pieces together, especially with the data mover behind it and see like, how would you actually fit all of this from uh, multiple clusters with the Arbiter cluster? Like, oh, we have, we have parts that we can do um, yep. Anyway, we'll, we'll definitely think that was my thought. I was like, oh, we should do an edge case with, uh, with the data mover for sure. That would be awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, great. Great. All right. Well, Thanks. if we don't have Thanks any more, I want to thank you all for, for joining. And um, we'll put together the next show and I'll, we'll put together a lovely description so everyone can find the parts that they need. And um, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Great. Care, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.